Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel. Douglas McGregor asserts that this marks the definitive phase, Dan. Previous actions were calculated and gradual, as Moscow hoped for a negotiating partner in the West, ideally, both European and American. However, that optimism has now evaporated. Moscow understands they must forge their own path forward. Consequently, we're witnessing intensified long-range precision strikes targeting critical infrastructure power grids, energy supplies, transportation networks, and military stop trials. First, all of those targets are being systematically aimed at, and the reason is straightforward. Once air defenses and energy sources are neutralized, two outcomes emerge. First, the civilian population, unable to sustain itself, evacuates voluntarily, which the Russians prefer. They aim to avoid urban warfare among populated areas. Second, they seek to eliminate threats to their forces from above, which top attack capabilities decisively provide across all military levels, tactical, operational, and strategic. Undoubtedly, the Russian forces possess ample manpower. However, facilitating civilian evacuations simplifies their operations. Historical ties underscore the Russian claim on cities like Kharkiv and Odessa, reiterated since 2022. The intent is clear these cities will return to Russian control. This underscores why experts like Ray McGovern advocate negotiation to minimize Ukrainian territorial and urban losses. Yet those opportunities have waned. The Russians seem resolved to move forward decisively. Their current focus lies further north and northeast of Odessa, delaying an immediate assault on the city itself. Meanwhile, Ukrainian efforts in Kiev evoke comparisons to Stalingrad, a scenario the Russians aim to avoid entirely, preferring dialogue with a viable government. The Russians face a critical challenge now. As you know well, there's little of a functioning government left, and the military structure is collapsing. Despite senior leadership efforts, public sentiment in western Ukraine shows widespread exhaustion and a strong desire for an end to the conflict. The Ukrainians are truly on their last legs, making any financial support beyond humanitarian aid pointless at this stage. Indeed, all these long-range strikes are preparatory. The ground won't be sufficiently solid until mid to late April to withstand the heavy armored forces Russia intends to deploy. Weather conditions, including recent snow and rain, could further delay major assault, possibly until May. These strikes aim to clear obstacles for larger offensives, ensuring minimal resistance when operations escalate. Furthermore, the Ukrainians' strongest defenses in the Donbass region have been compromised. Years of fortified positions have been abandoned, leaving hastily constructed and discontinuous defenses vulnerable to Russian maneuvers. Despite internal challenges, Ukrainian resistance continues, complicated by actions from the SBU, the secret police, which are reportedly targeting civilians behind Russian lines. Well, he believes the risk is exceedingly high without a doubt. The inability to evacuate wounded in time to save lives is a stark reality. Put yourself in the shoes of a Ukrainian soldier engaged with Russians, knowing that severe injuries likely mean no timely medical care until it's too late. How would morale hold up under such circumstances? Historically, the strength of the U.S., military, especially the army, has been its ability to evacuate and preserve lives. Unfortunately, that capability is severely lacking now. Furthermore, the absence of robust air medical evacuation assets complicates matters. The days of helicopters swiftly picking up wounded are over. The logistical infrastructure crucial for warfare, including medical support and evacuation, is nearly depleted on the Ukrainian side. This undermines sustained military operations and wears down morale, leading many to reconsider their situation and potentially opt to leave the battlefield altogether. In his view, there's a distinct American mindset deeply ingrained in Europeans as well. That meticulous planning guarantees success. 
However, reality often contradicts such expectations, especially in military operations, where plans rarely survive enemy contact. But he draws parallels between NATO's current approach approach and the French military's tactics in 1940, where predefined lines of defense were quickly rendered irrelevant by German maneuvers. NATO, he argues, remains reluctant to accept the gravity of the situation until Russian forces advance and seize territory up to Kharkiv and potentially Odessa. Despite this impending reality, some factions within NATO still consider deploying small contingents like French, Baltic, and Polish forces with vague notions of defending Odessa by crossing southern Ukraine impractical and risky strategy given Russian surveillance and targeting capabilities. He stresses that prolonging the conflict unnecessarily costs Ukrainian lives and delays regional recovery. This war, in his estimation, has reached its decisive phase, and delaying the inevitable only he exacerbates the situation on the ground. Well, from his perspective, the current leadership under Donald Tusk, closely aligned with the European Union, doesn't reflect the sentiments of the majority of Polish citizens. Support for the war in Ukraine has sharply declined, now resting at less than 30% serious backing. The idea of sending Polish troops into the conflict zone would likely garner even less support, he believes, making such discussions largely rhetorical and lacking in substance. He dismisses notions significant military deployments by European nations, such as Finnish troops moving thousands of soldiers towards Odessa near the Romanian border as unrealistic chatter amidst approaching endgame scenarios. He anticipates more of this rhetoric as events unfold, particularly as Russian forces consolidate control over cities like Odessa, Kharkiv, and much of eastern Ukraine. Looking ahead, he suggests that the next phase hinges on whether changes occur within Western and Eastern European governments. If leadership remains unchanged, the Russians may perceive no alternative but to pursue their objectives further westward. He maintains that none of them are willing to acknowledge the reality Russian air and missile defenses rank among the world's most formidable, if not the best. Their density necessitates a cautious ground offensive to protect Russian forces from the exact threats described, including potential engagements with F-16s. Any attempt to deploy aircraft into the region would likely result in significant losses. This stark this assessment echoes historical parallels, such as the Soviet approach during the Korean War when Russian pilots were inserted into Chinese aircraft to mitigate similar risks. His primary concern revolves around the possibility that as Ukrainian capabilities falter and aircraft losses mount, there may be calls to involve American, Dutch, German, and other personnel in combat aircraft, a move he views as a grave mistake. Such actions could escalate their status from mere supporters to direct participants in the conflict, a scenario fraught with serious implications. However, he emphasizes that everything hinges on the law. He points out a critical issue in the West, the widespread narrative of an unprovoked invasion, which he vehemently contests as false. He references scholars like Professor Mearsheimer, who argue that Western actions have fueled and exacerbated this conflict rather than the Russians seeking confrontation. According to him, Russia has consistently sought to avoid such clashes with the West. Putin's recent statements reflect this stance, asserting that he will not tolerate attacks on NATO bases if F-16s are based in Ukraine and fly from there. In his view, the position outlined by this individual is untenable and unsustainable. He predicts it cannot persist much longer under current circumstances. Actually, he believes it's plausible. He suggests that within the next 60 to 90 days, President Biden might resign, taking with him the primary responsibility for what he describes as a catastrophic and disastrous situation. In this scenario, Vice President would then assume the presidency, though the question of who would become Vice President remains unclear to him. He asserts this possibility is real and shouldn't be dismissed, noting discussions about it in European and NATO circles, where the prevailing sentiment is that the war in Ukraine has effectively concluded.